I welcome you, the audience, an uh, online audience here from the Plenarsaal at the Akademie der Künste Berlin to the panel discussion, Resonating Struggles, Paul and Eslanda Robson in East Berlin. My name is Julia Gerlach. I'm the secretary of the music section at the Academy of Arts. I also welcome the three panelists who are connected to us remotely. The composer, musician and mixed media artist Matana Roberts, the professor of German language, musician and musicologist Kira Thurman, and the curator and theorist Doreen Mende. And I welcome the moderator of the panel here on site, the professor of American music, composer and musician George Lewis. The panel discussion today is part of the overarching program Arbeit am Gedächtnis Transforming Archives with events and an exhibition happening from May to November 2021. With this important topic, the Akademie der Künste, in the context of its 325th anniversary, is reflecting anew on its own institution as a place of memory storage and on the political and critical dimension of memory. A special focus is on the artistic examination of archives and memory as an artistic strategy. 13 artistic works have been commissioned for the large exhibition, which will open here at Pariser Platz on June 17. The exhibition includes the commissioned audiovisual installation Resonance by Matana Roberts, which refers to the Afro-American singer, actor and lawyer Paul Robson and the anthropologist, journalist and manager Eslanda Robson. The work is dedicated to their tireless fight for civil rights in the US and against racism and is related to the partial archive of Paul and Eslanda Robson housed at the Akademie der Künste. Matada Roberts' installation is presented here in the historic storewell of the old Academy building, which was largely destroyed during the war and can be experienced until September. The examination of our own archive in preparation for this exhibition also led us to the Paul Robson archive, whose existence at the Akademie der Künste is the result of a revealing history of entanglements closely connected to the German-German history and the Cold War, and which will certainly occupy us beyond this year's program. The Paul Robson archive, which also includes the Eslanda Robson archive, was founded in 1965 at the Akademie der Künste East in the GDR on the basis of a Paul Robson committee that existed at the Academy from 1958 onwards and is part today of the music archive of the United Akademie der Künste. It consists of several sub-archives, including an archive stock of the Paul Robson Committee in London from the 50s. It contains musical scores, records and films, articles, photographs, also of visits by the Robsons to the GDR and the Soviet Union, international correspondence and manuscripts by the anthropologist Eslanda Robson. How entangled the story is, is also made clear by the fact that Franz Löser, who was sent to England as a Jewish boy during the Second World War, met Robson in the US, founded a Robson committee in London in the McCarthy era, and then migrated to the GDR and continued his work for and with Paul Robson there, with which resulted in the foundation of the archive. It is important to mention that since the founding of the German Academy of Arts in East Berlin in the GDR, the full members elected year after year important artists of the time from all over the world as their corresponding members until 1992 at least 209, including the US civil rights activist Paul Robson. It is also, also particularly interesting that Paul and Eslanda Robson were and are well-known personalities in East Germany, but rather unknown in West Germany. It is also interesting to see how the reunification of East and West Germany and the two academies led to a loss of importance of the corresponding members and the archives created in GDR times such as that of Paul Robson, which also had propagandistic tasks to fulfill during the GDR times. 
Looking back at Paul and Esranda Robson implies sorting out a complex history. Addressing these issues and remembering the important actions of Paul and Leslanda Robson today, facing questions of racism, colonialism and diversity, are the starting points for the panel discussion to which I now would like to hand over to George Lewis. George Lewis is Edward H. Case Professor of American Music at Columbia University and a renowned composer of contemporary music and especially electronic and computer music. He is known as improviser and pioneer of interactive computer music. Among his many acknowledgments, I would like to mention that he is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science and a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. Currently, he is fellow for one year of the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin. He has published widely musical works as well as musicological texts and has especially focused his curatorial work on the visibility of composers from Africa and its diaspora. And in this context, he has presented together with Ensemble Modern a concert program this year at Merz Musik Festival in Berlin and has formulated eight difficult steps of decolonizing contemporary music for a symposium here at the Academy in September. From the first idea to work on the Robson archive in last summer on, George Lewis has been our important advisor and we would like to thank you for the ongoing conversation and the many thoughtful re recommendations. And I now would like to hand over to you and uh, to moderate this panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also to the panelists. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you very much. Um, hello to everyone. Um, I'd like to add my welcome to that of Yulia Gerlach for uh, this evening's panel. And also I'd like to welcome the panelists who are ex all extraordinary people. I'm going to uh, read their brief bios and then we'll sort of move on to uh, a, what I expect to be a very scintillating uh, discussion. Um, I'll start with Doreen Mende, who is a curator, theorist, exhibition maker, educator, associate professor of curatorial slash politics, and director of the Critical Curatorial Cybernetic Research Practices, Master and PhD Forum at the Visual Arts Department at HEAD Genève, and principal investigator of decolonizing socialism, entangled internationalism. 29th, it's a grant uh, from 20, acting from 2019 to 2024, funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. Mende is author and editor of academic, essayistic, and experimental writings on the geopolitics of exhibition making, archival metabolism, internationalism, and visual regimes. Her work has been published in the Oxford Handbook of Communist Visual Cultures, Eflux Journal, MIT Press, Sternberg Press, Koenig Books, Spectre Books, the, Jeru the Jerusalem Quarter Quarterly, etc. Mende holds a PhD in visual cultures from Goldsmiths, University of London. She's a co-founding member of the European Forum for Advanced Practices, as well as of multiple artistic mobilities at the Kunsthistorisches Institute of the University of Zurich. Since 2015, she has been a founding member of the Harun Faraki Institute in Berlin. Welcome, Doreen Mende, thank you. Martina Roberts is an internationally known composer band leader, saxophonist, sound experimentalist, and mixed media practitioner. Self-taught for the most part, Roberts works in many contexts and medium, including improvisation, dance, poetry, and theater. They are perhaps best known for the acclaimed Coin Coin Project, a multi-chapter work of panoramic sound quilting that aims to expose the mystical roots and channel the, innovative, the intuitive spirit-raising traditions of American creative expression while maintaining a deep and substantive engagement with narrativity, history, community, and political expression within improvisatory musical structures. Roberts has been invited to teach, lecture, run workshops, and or take up artistic residencies in countless places and with diverse communities over the past decade, and as a past faculty member of the Band for Creative Music Workshop, School for Improvised Music, and Bard College. In 2019, they were a fellow in the De A A Day Artists in Berlin program, and welcome Martina Roberts. 
Kira Thurman is an assistant professor of Germanic languages and literatures and history at the University of Michigan. A classically trained pianist who grew up in Vienna, Austria, Thurman earned her PhD in history from the University of Rochester with a minor field in musicology from the Eastman School of Music. Her research focuses on two topics that occasionally converge, the relationship between music and German national identity and Central Europe's historical and contemporary relationship with the black diaspora. She is the recipient of many awards and fellowships, including a Fulbright Fellowship to Germany, the Berlin Prize from the American Caddy in Berlin, and a residential fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Her book, Singing Like Germans, Black Music in the Land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, is now published by Cornell University Press, just now. Thurman teaches courses on a wide variety of subjects, including music and German national identity, Germany and the Black diaspora, global cultural encounters since 1800, global migration, and performing race, gender, nation. Together with colleagues across the United States and Europe, and with the support of the German Historical Institute in Washington, D.C., Kira Thurman runs the public history website, blackcentraleurope.com. Thank you, Kira. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Um, each of our panelists sent along a short essay summarizing and theorizing their work with the art archive. Now, I'd like each of you to provide a short summary of those remarks, after which I'd like to pose a couple of questions to each of you. And after that, we can kind of have a general discussion. I do regret for the audience that we are not provisioned to take questions from the audience this evening. So the, well, that means I'll ask a few more questions. So if I could start with you, Martina Roberts. I don't hear her. You can hear me now, yes? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, very sorry. Uh, my focus was on what it meant for Paul Robeson and Eslanda Robeson to be from the United States, but yet not be accepted as citizens in their country. Um, my focus uh, in the work that I created for this exhibition has a lot to do with the power of memory and the power of history that I know, though I did not know them, of course, uh, that Paul and Eslanda Robeson pulled on in order to stay committed to a very uh, futurist vision that they had for themselves, while at the same time living very visionary lives. I mean, uh, the biography of Eslanda Robeson, for one, is, is, is one for the ages. Um, reading about her and understanding the things that she moved through and the ways in which she created opportunities um, for Paul Robeson as well as herself. It's just amazing to see. To have a deeper understanding also of the ways in which the ways in which Paul and Eslanda Robeson suffered in terms of trying to move forward with their vision. I was stunned by time and time again how they could continue to get back up day after day, time after time, um, while being knocked, knocked down over and over again by their own birth country and also in a sense of kind of paraded around as propaganda um, in some other aspects of their lives. Um, I, I took a, a, a great inspiration uh, from the ways in which they inserted themselves into different cultures, into different communities, the ways in which they broaden their reach uh, and pure understanding of what it means to be a global citizen at a time that I'm not sure Americans, let alone African Americans, were being given a chance to think about. So those were my, um, those were my main themes and focuses in the work that I created. Thank you very much, Martina. Um, I, I guess we have, if you'd like to say anything else, we have a bit more time. But if not, I could move along to um, Doreen Mende. Okay. Hello. Good evening. Thank you so much, George Lewis. It's a 
pleasure to be in conversation with you, uh, Matana and Kira. I'm much looking forward. So um, I have been working uh, with uh, Eslanda, Essi, Cardoso, the ropes and that I came across in the writings by Barbara Rensby in her biography that has been published a couple of years ago. And uh, then, uh, you know, looking into the archive of Akademie der Künste, there are a couple of boxes uh, archived under the Paul Robeson archive. And um, I have been choosing to work with Eslanda Essi Robeson as an interlocutor, but also as a kind of a transgenerational voice and as a point of entry to study and to engage into the trajectories of a black feminism, of an intersectional feminism, of an anti-colonial also internationalism that has been crossing the geography of the East, and you can say the East of Germany, but I would like to understand that more as an entangled geography of struggles where the East should not be isolated as much as Islanda Robeson was a prolific writer and holder of speeches and traveler and uh, interlocutor and uh, you know sh her reports are fantastic for example the 140 million women can't be wrong which she published in 45 and i've chosen islanda robeson as this interlocutor to think about uh, an internationalism a world making after internationalism so my approach to the archive is very much informed by acknowledging the struggles that both Islanda and Paul Robson have been experienced, not only in 63, but throughout the archiving process. So how do we engage with an archival substance or maybe to call this an antiphonal substance as a substance that is speaking back and resonating, vibrating in the present, while considering the violence of erasure and the violence also of exclusion, I mean, in the 70s, 80s, but specifically also in 89, 1992, uh, you know, when the global uh, world order rearranged itself. And for, I mean, this um, uh, has been a continuous trajectory to think through the possibility of an archival metabolism in order to think with Eslanda Robeson a world making after internationalism. And uh, I'm happy to elaborate further and I'm looking forward to the conversation. And it's a very pertinent project for me personally, and also political man uh, matters, uh, looking at the political landscapes we are living in. So there is an urgency to engage with that. And um, I'm sure we share this on this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doreen. And uh, Kira Thurman, um, please have a Thank you all so much for this invitation and for having me here as well. Um, this might sound strange, but I think the Académie der Künste Archive in Berlin is my favorite archive, if I'm allowed to have a favorite archive uh, in, in Berlin. But um, so I think as a historian and musicologist, I think what I will talk about is the context uh, in East Germany for understanding Paul Robeson and Eslanda Robeson's tour in 1960. Um, and that's to point out, I think, in the same way as perhaps Matana and Doreen, um, how extraordinary uh, Paul Robeson and Aslanda Robeson were. But at the same time, also, I think, to say that um, they were part also of the greater context of mm -hmm. African Americans coming to um, Germany, but also specifically East Germany. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s. So, um, and that East Germany, I, I got the way that I've described it before is it's a sort of mutual symbiotic relationship that um, East Germany held up African Americans as political symbols um, and used it in some ways as a legitimizing tool, legitimating tool. Um, uh, and rightly so, in a lot of ways, that they pointed out that, um, you know, they stood in solidarity with African American civil rights, that they um, understood um, and were supportive of anti colonialist struggles and anti capitalist struggles um, and recognized uh, the problems of racism. So, in a lot of ways, uh, East Germany was. Um, 
you know, it positioned itself, I guess I could say, as a land and as a space that was welcoming to African American political activists. So Angela Davis came to visit, Martin Luther King Jr. came to visit. Um, Paul Robeson as well. Um, but I think what is perhaps surprising um, for people is that also African-American soldiers um, stationed in Germany uh, occasionally defected also uh, and left the military and, and crossed the wall, so to speak, um, and then lived in uh, East Germany up until um, the fall of the wall, really. So there is this really fascinating long history of uh, African-American entanglements with East Germany specifically. I think one other example I can give, if that's helpful, is um, Many of the translations of African American poetry um, also uh, were produced and mm -hmm. created in in East Germany specifically. So Langston Hughes poetry um, and and other African American poets were translated um, uh, in East Germany um, pretty prolifically and pretty seriously. Um, and so it's this mutually symbiotic relationship in which um, you know East Germany is kind of holding up African American political activists as symbols and saying that they stand in solidarity with them. Um, but it also went both ways, that it was also really useful for African-Americans um, to travel to East Germany um, and to find, uh, always looking for allies, always looking for people to stand um, with them and, and that they could use it as a form of, of international pressure, um, so to speak, uh, in, in communicating back in the United States saying, look at all of the support we have from around the world. Um, so when I think about Paul Robeson's tour in 1960 um, and him getting the Medal of Peace from uh, the Kumbhut Universität and all of that, it very much fits that that model and that mold. Um, and and that there and the ways in which they chose to celebrate him him reflected that. I will say I'm I'm going to be the most critical in some ways, um, which I think George Lewis already knows, <laughs> having read my work, uh, of of how oftentimes Paul Robeson was uh, received in East Germany that that he fit the mold so well of what the East German state was looking for and what a lot of East Germans were looking for as the sort of African-American hero. Um, but what I also look at in my scholarship in general and in my research is there are other African-Americans who, when they did not fit that model or did not fit that mold, mm -hmm. um, were not treated as well. Um, so, I mean, I can get more into it later, but I think that is something to think about is that, is that this, this initiative to bring Paul Robeson and Islanda, and Islanda Robeson to East Germany was a powerful moment of international solidarity um, in the wake of Paul Robeson finally getting his passport back. The United States had denied him his passport for years. Um, before he was finally able to start traveling again around 1958 when the committee formed. It was when he was uh, finally able to get his passport back. Um, you know, so this is a moment of international solidarity, but nonetheless, I was and am uh, skeptical in some ways, or maybe just occasionally suspicious of how, um, of how people understood Blackness, American blackness, mm -hmm. um, you know, in all of these different ways, um, even for somebody as wonderful as, as Paul Robeson. Well, thank you, Kira. Thanks to all of you um, for those introductions. And I can tell you, uh, our audience, that those three introductions, as wonderful as they are, really are just a part of their very intricate ways in which uh, our three panelists have engage the, the Robeson archive. I read them all uh, a couple of times, and I have a few questions, actually. Um, but first, I have a short introduction. I said I wasn't going to be a respondent, but you know, I'm sitting here and I just couldn't mm. resist, you know? I mean, so I'd like to share those with you and with the audience. I mean, I'm thinking most about, at the moment, about Shauna L. Redmond's extraordinary hermeneutic treatment of Paul Robeson in her recent book, Everything Man, the form and function of Paul Robeson, which takes its title from a quotation from Islanda Good Robeson. She writes, everything, everybody, everybody asked him to be everywhere. 
And you know, it's kind of funny. You know, I'm an African-American academic at a sort of a big-time institution, and that really is still the case. I mean, you, as an Af- the, Afro- the, the few Afro-diasporic academics are mm-hmm. called upon to be constantly a part of diversity committees or whatever it is in order to basically hide the lack of diversity in these institutions more generally. And I think that might resonate with some of the experiences that some of the people on the panel have had. Now, a recurring theme in Redmond's book is the primary role of voice as productive of social status, cultural image. And this relates to the work also of Nina Sun Eitheim on voice and race. And in this case, sound becomes a prime site for struggles over representation as a resource. Doreen Mendes' article speaks of, quote, those who are not surprised, hashtag, but are speechless, made invisible, silenced, cannot breathe, or who speak but are barely heard. Redmond's chapter on vibration connects the sensory aspect of personal listening to Robeson, and that folds out into account of how his voice could move audiences to reassemble themselves as political and social actors. And I think both Matana Roberts and Kira Thurman's articles address the consequences of this issue. But I'd like to start with Doreen here. And I was researching her concept of archival metabolism, which I think is very important. And I came across another article, a publication mm-hmm. in Eflux called The Undutiful Daughter's Concept mm-hmm. of Archival Metabolism, where you mm-hmm. write, the problem with formative 20th century theories of the archive is their monocultural commitment to the law as it was naturally, as if it were naturally given. Quote, the archive is first the law of what can be said. Well, instead of defining the work with the archive only as leading toward excavation finds of the expert who masters, quote, the law of what can be said, quoting from Michel Foucault, the proposal of an archival metabolism considers the archival as a transformative system that metabolizes data toward its own laws and languages, as well as its own sociabilities, geographies, and time zones with the possibility to, quote, initiate what is not yet there. And that's very interesting. That really set me flowing, so to speak. And you go on to suggest the performativity of the archive. Mm -hmm. You write, what if the archive whispers dissonantly in various voices? I like that, whispering dissonantly. (laughs) And operates within transgenerational time and misunderstanding, Mm -hmm. deracinating the mechanisms of linear narratives. Well, here... I thought that a discussion of the relation between archive and performance could be helpful, especially considering you, the the, the composition of the panel uh, this evening. Um, I was thinking of performance theorist Diana Taylor's 2003 book, The Archive and the Repertoire, which is a wide-ranging and strongly politically inflected analysis, and that rightly identifies the fiction of the internally unchanging, stable, unmediated archive. Now, extending Taylor, I take archival metabolism, you can tell me, Doreen, if I'm on the right track or wildly off base. Um, I take that as the sense in which an archive actually enacts a repertoire. So you get an apparently disembodied memory that nonetheless produces gestures, orality, dance and movement, and in the case of Paul Robeson, voice. So starting off with that, how does that feel to you? Thank you so much, George. That's really amazing. Uh, like observation and uh, how you understand and mobilize the archival metabolism. Uh, it's great. Thank you. And it's um, uh, it has become pertinent and really important specifically while working on archival substances that have been departing from political geographies of anti-imperialist politics, of solidarities, political friendships, of forms of internationalism that have um, infrastructurally and institutionally pretty much disappeared after 89 and 1990, not only disappeared, violently erased or repressed. So um, archival metabolism is an attempt to look into these historic moments as trans-historic moments, transgenerational moments, while considering the extreme tension between 
these macro-political infrastructures of state socialisms. Let's not forget, and I think Kira is writing about this uh, very pertinently, importantly, that the one-state socialism in East Germany was a white patriarchal, geriatric, uh, anti-intellectual socialism. So it depended on specific people that made a huge effort to introduce different possibilities. So we have on one that the macro structures of a socialist kind of entity that sits in the global Cold War, and perhaps the micro social potencies that come across in form of practices of the undocumented of that what is whispered of that that is like you know slipping through as Landa Robeson has a conversation in an, um, Radio East Germany I think in 1963 was a year when the po both Robesons were quite intensely in East Germany and you know the interviewer continuously misnames her misnames her as Esmeralda but also, you know, speaks the N-word, which is so disturbing. And Eslanda, like, very um, loudly says, okay, Eslanda is my name. So this, you know, these kind of um, things, elements that would usually slip through uh, a more classical historical observation, but that matters for a contemporary approach to the archive, let's say, from a curatorial slash politics perspective, that wants to mobilize this tension between the macro and the micro as a potency and as problematics. I mean, how can we think with that in the contemporary condition? And how can we think this transgenerationality regarding for the rope sense, regarding a black political life or an anti-colonial internationalism and a condition of blackness as the kind of the matrix to think with and to rehearse also friendships, in regard to the transgenerationality of technology, of images, of sounds, of the records being transposed and also transgenerationally transmuted, um, I mean, mutations play a role into the present. And I think it's really necessary uh, for specifically this kind of narratives and archival substances that speak of independence and liberation and of uh, Black Lives Matter in the present moment, and also a, a Black internationalism and the world communism, that, you know, you can't just take this copy-paste into the present condition. It needs a processing. And this is what this concept tries to do, and it is not easy, it is an infrastructure, it's a complex, and I thank you very much, George, because, um, uh, yeah, you, you put this very uh, greatly, and I would like to attach this and see it as a methodology for decolonizing socialism, decolonizing internationalism that not all, always only was anti-imperialist and anti-fascist. So how do we open up that space, this extreme tension between the macro and the micro? And this is where this proposition comes in as a need to decolonize also, you know, where we are with our research practices in the present. Wow. Um, you know, I have a lot of questions, and I'm going to have a lot of questions to everyone, but uh, if anyone wants to jump in there, please do. I, I just want to say I love uh, everything Doreen said, <laughs> um, you know, especially thinking about, uh, you know, there are more conversations these days, I think, about decolonizing the archive as well. I mean, obviously led by Doreen and others. And so just you know, having it all come full circle with uh, with this one, with, you know, with the Academy de Künste and with um, the Paul Robeson archive, it's really fascinating and it's hitting home I think so many important points about voices being heard, voices being silenced um, in, re in really fascinating ways. So. Mm -hmm. um, here's another thing. We were just talking, you were just talking about decolonization, Doreen, and you've got a project of decolonizing socialism, which has seemed to be something that Stuart Hall and CLR James, among a number of others, were trying to do. Could, and that's a real project of yours. Could you say more about that in the context of this archival project? Yes, yeah, sure. So, um, uh, the decolonizing socialism and international, uh, internationalism is, uh, you know, a multi-part uh, study project. And in this context, uh, my point of departure is one specific photograph of the Akademie der Künste archive 
that portrays Islanda as Sigurd Robson and Franz Löser, uh, who was very important to introduce the Robsons into East Germany, as observers of uh, trial in the Supreme Court of East Germany against the Nazi lawyer Hans Maria Globke on the 8th of mm. July in 1963. And uh, this one photograph is, uh, you know, it's been taken by Eva Brückmann, a uh, very official photograph, but it shows Islanda sitting there and opening up a constellation between uh, an internationalism uh, like that Islanda brings in of a black pan-Africanist perspective and Franz Löser as a kind of a philosopher of logic who developed a communist understanding of cybernetics, a Marxist ethics to introduce ethics into technology and cybernetics as the kind of um, points of, uh, inter I mean, as like, the main reference frames, let's say, that compose the condition to address the staging of anti-fascism. So when it comes to decolonizing socialism, I am interested in to uh, look in very specific moments and to find portals where it becomes possible to enter these forms of micro-social practices I mentioned earlier in order to complexify, to move from the binarism of the Cold War, that, and, and we have lived this also until a couple of years ago in the East, that the binarism has continued, that the East is only this and only that, and now it's like, you know, also the rise of, um, of fascism in the East, and it needs to be complexified, and the project of complexification is a project of decolonization. And I'm trying to do this by being extremely precise, but looking into this transgender generational alliances in thought, but also in technology, and how this can be unfolded via a curatorial artistic approach. And, you know, I mean, I admire the work of also, like, uh, Matana, I saw your exhibition also in the DAAD and your work, and it's just amazing to see. I think this is what artistic practices, sonic practices are able to do, and where we need this form also of, uh, you know, capacity of experimentation and transdisciplinarity. It's not so easy otherwise possible. Thank you. Yeah. I just have one more question because, you know, this is fascinating. Did you say, well, maybe two more questions. Did you say mutations? Oh, yes. Very compelled by understanding the metabolism also as a possibility of mutations, of uh, transmutations and transformations, while not forgetting um, you know, um, the violences that have been taking place in the moment of archiving, but also in, uh, in, in, a, in a decade, I mean, in, in like half a century. Yes, so I, I did. I do. The, yeah. The reason why I asked you that was because, you know, I, someone somewhere, I can't remember now, around 2012 or 2013, to ask me to write about the archives, which is something I don't really do much in archives, so I felt like an idiot doing this. But in the end, after reading Diana Taylor's book and after giving this talk around 2013 or so, I came up with this idea about mutation, which sounds a lot like what you're talking about. It's like, I'll just tell you what it said. It's about archival memory, and I think your archival metabolism concept was developed in dialogue with uh, digital technology in particular, which is where this is coming from. And digital technology, the thing about that is it mutates all the time. You know, the cosmic rays come in, a bit changes, and suddenly you can't access that archive anymore. It's as simple as that. So it kind of mutates by itself, and, so, and, and it also has to be refreshed through process of repetition, which is what we're doing. In a way, we're refreshing the archive. And, uh, and this, is, this is its means of mutating. And it's also a means by which the archive becomes indeterminate as well as rhizomatic. I mean, it becomes something that um, um, it's like Heisenberg. You know, uh, it changes because we observe it. It changes because we interact with it. But it needs. But these mutations are driven by indeterminacy, and they, and that kind of instability, is what's exciting about the archive now. Um, so that's what made me think about this. I, I have one more little question for you. Um, well, maybe two. Um, 
archival, I mean, the, dig, the Robeson archive is not a digital archive, right? It's, you know, it's, it's on paper, it's, uh, it's photographs, it's physical stuff. There's a costume that he, he wore for Othello. And there's the papers of Eslanda Good Robeson, which you concentrated on for your work, which is actually very interesting all by itself. So does your concept of art, Archival metabolism, does it transform even a 20th century nominally non-digital archive like the one, like the Robeson, Ar Robeson archive? Yeah. Um, I mean, on one side, yeah, it exists an analog form, very material that we can always invite as material agents. But on the other hand, the way we work with it is scans. It's a digital formats. I mean, I have a drive where the documents are so the photographs i work with the photograph i work with is circulating pretty widely even on the wikipedia entry of Eslanda robeson which i quite like you know that it's an image that circulates but has wrong captions and things are missing and um so uh in that sense i think we do work with digitized matter and then you know i go back to the materiality of the of the matter as it's been sitting in the archive itself but regarding with your question of metabolism um, and the analog and the digital archive what we are trying to do now and this is really not easy uh, i'm working on this now to articulate um, this metabolism technologically speaking how could we think the image in transgenerational terms that allows us to connect the technology of the loudspeaker and the Supreme Court in 63 of the TV camera because it's highly mediatized and of the, of the headphones as Landa is wearing because she is listening to the translation. How could this connect to the computer technology screen of Photoshop of, you know, sound um, uh, processing, image processing software and so on to move from the representational level of the photograph as we know it into the infrastructural level that allows us to unfold the complexity. I mean, you know, to go through the registers that we want to discuss uh, by looking into this photograph. Uh, and this is, I have to say, this is not easy. We are, I'm uh, asking many people at the moment, students, former students, colleagues, uh, who could help for me to do this archival metabolism of this image and technological, but also political, techno-political discursive uh, let's say terms. So this is where we are at the moment, and I hope it will be working. I mean, I don't know yet. I have a science fiction episode in mind where this kind of politics of memory, technologically speaking, comes uh, is a core um, a piece. But uh, I don't want to take more space, uh, more space, and you know, I'm happy to elaborate on this later. Thank well, you. you know, it could be science fiction, but then. You know, the Memex was science fiction in the 40s. So um, I, I might move ahead, even though, because I really want to say one more thing. I mean, there's a lot we didn't cover, um, certainly. But you ask, where can transgenerational transmissions from Paul Robeson, Eslanda Robeson, May Ayam, Audrey Lord, or Miriam McCabe within the archive, where can that be mobilized for talking, learning from, listening, and fostering today's public debates? I think this is a question with which uh, both Martina and Kira are also vitally concerned. I'd like to move to ask Martina a few questions, if that's okay about this. Um, sure. You talked about the futurist vision of Paul and Islanda just now. Could you say more about that? Um. I recognized in them a, a certain sort of uh, um, dedication to history past, but also history future, because they come from a history of which they were able to benefit in some sense from sacrifices of people in their ancestral line that fought for some of the freedoms, the very limited freedoms, but still freedoms that they were able to have during their lifetime. Um, and also made them fully aware that the freedoms that they were being given were not enough and that there, there was more to fight for, uh, there was more to excavate, um, document, and bring witness to. Yeah, I mean, you wrote in your essay 
There have been times in my own life when I have looked to history to cope with my experiences of just being a black body in a vast world. And to me, that points to a kind of empathy in your encounter with the Robeson Archive. And then later you write, and your essay is about resonance. And certainly he says, the term resonance can be defined as the quality in a sound of being deep, full, and reverberating, or when thinking about resonance as applied to an image, it brings to mind clarity of depending upon your, our own associated memories and experience. Now, for me, empathy is also a form of resonance. You know, the mirror neuron system is a form of resonance. I mean, and you know, you made a, you made a piece in dialogue with the Robeson Archive. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that piece about? Or what is it going to be about? I, they took me to the place where it was, and it looked fascinating. I was looking forward to seeing it when it all comes out. It's an amazing piece. It's in this big stair... Well, you should describe it. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's, I'm, I'm so excited that uh, people will be able to, to interact with it and, and, and enjoy it. Um, I have always looked to history as a sense of coping with a certain sort of um, layers and layers upon filters that I have to deal with as a black body in the world, but as a black artist who has to, I mean, everybody has to answer to somebody. I've, I've come to that conclusion as of recently, but my work has to constantly be filtered through a white gaze in or even in order to garner support or you know criticality but always um white gaze rarely do i get to intercept with the black gaze first other than my own before having to filter through and then have it loop back around and hope that it that it reaches other people so when looking at the archive i just you know it made me think a lot about the, how the lives of, of Black artists through generations is, is essentially theme and variations. Like these same um, themes that, that Paul and Aslanda, you know, there are things that they have been through that I'm not certain that I would have been able to, to handle. Um, but still, because of the um, perniciousness of systematic racism, and the way that it still sits within uh, the root work, I guess, as they'd say, in, in most um, institutions, uh, I really just recognize a certain sort of reminder to stay in the fight, looking at their work, that they could stay in the fight of what they were dealing with and still in some sense thrive. And also what I, what I very much took from the archive was seeing how hard they worked until the very end, really. You know, reading letters uh, as Londa Robeson was writing from her hospital bed or, or um, getting, an, getting an idea of the amount of exhaustion uh, that Paul Robeson was dealing with while also, you know, um, I don't even know if it's even safe to talk about the CIA, but the ways in which uh, Paul and Aslanda Robeson were being, in a sense, to me, tortured by their own government while even abroad. Um, so I, the resonance for me, thinking about resonance, it's a, it's a reminder of many things, but I also have to make sure that it's measured because, you know, sometimes there have been times where I wake up and go, well, you know, this is not going to be the greatest day, but at least I'm not on a plantation somewhere picking cotton or in a big house having to, you know, do God knows what in order to survive. But that's still a very low sense of measurement. Um, and, and I got from the archive uh, just massive insp inspiration to remain a Black body in the world, to remain a Black artist in the world, to continue to push through and hold my head as high as I can within reason uh, to create the world that I wish to see. What comes to mind in what you just said is a sense of precarity, which uh, perhaps we've all been through. And if we want to talk about 
the CIA, one of the classic novels uh, by John A. Williams, The Man Who Cried I Am, is about Richard Wright's uh, encounters and surveillance by the CIA, which was not uncommon, COINTELPRO, all these kinds of things. Not, you know, not, um, not conspiracy theories, this sort of thing. I mean, one, at least one of the Martin Luther King biographies, you find out that uh, the dialogue is not made up, but it comes from the tapes that were made of him. And so you start to see that, or for example, an organization that we're both a part of, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, I discovered in their archive a consent degree from the Chicago Police Department saying they would no longer uh, surveil the AACM. So, um, <laughs> so, and that was interesting because that was to, during the time that I was very active in Chicago in the organization. So I'm sure there's a bunch of files there somewhere. But the thing is now, you talked about the white gaze. Is, the, is yours the black gaze on the, on the Robeson archive? And what does that produce? Your, this gets okay. into your process of working with the archive. Ah, okay. So I, you know, within my own work outside of, of, of this piece, I deal a lot with creating my own archives in which to pull from and, and, and make work. So in a sense, thumbing through papers, old photographs, letters, images, costumes, you know, all these things. Um, these are things I get really excited about because when I look at an image, uh, when I read a letter, when I hear a sound, I automatically attach narrative, some sort of narrative or idea of narrative to uh, something that I'm dealing with. Um, and so I spent a lot of time looking at images. You know, there's so many different ways in which to take in an image. There's so many different things in which one could concentrate on and diffuse um, and making point decisions on the things that really uh, pulled my curiosity in. Uh, but I also spent a lot of time reading Eslanda, uh, Eslanda Robeson's um, writings, interviews. Um, I spent a lot of time reading personal letters was fascinating. I spent a lot. I spent some time fangirling over or fan personing over letters they were getting from other people within the archive. You know, just putting my hand on a. I remember the first time I picked up a letter that was written by Josephine Baker. I almost fell out in my chair. You know, just these these little things or incredible world leaders, um, seeing interviews that were so. <laughs> The one interview, one publication sticks out to me in particular, and it was the book that Eslanda Robeson did in conjunction with Pearl S. Buck. And there's an interview in that book where the things that Pearl S. Buck is saying are so outlandish. And the amount of, of class and calm um, that the Robesons had to have in terms of intercepting with these people who supposedly supported them, again, through this idea of the of the white gaze, I just found fascinating. So, so from there, I, I look for points of inspiration, but I also within text can hear rhythm, see rhythm, can think about um, sounds. Um, I also spent time listening to recordings of uh, Islanda Robeson's voice, which is really interesting, really interesting texture and sound, and you know, and also Paul Robeson and, and imagining what conversations must have been like for them. But also getting a very clear idea of the importance of teamwork mm. and the amount of um, support that they had to get each, give each other to push through and the amount of at which times was uneven uh, in terms of the weight that I that I feel was on Eslanda Robeson's shoulders at times, and then how that would transfer to Paul Robeson also, and having a deeper understanding of the of just the sheer anxiety um, that was induced by the situations that they were involved in, and so I just weave all those things together to come up with something that is a whole. Well, it's very interesting to me because when I have encountered your work over the years, um, the intense engagement with 
virtual, uh, fictive, and real archives all blend together. So when you're listening to it or when you're seeing it, in a way, the archive becomes sensuous and spiritual. So for me, that's something I take away from your work. And so it makes perfect sense. I mean, maybe could you describe what the piece is going to look like for those who can't get to Berlin right now? Or? It's, a, it's the 16 uh, channel sound piece, um, moving image, um, multimedia piece that will be in the stairwell. Um, situation on a netted screen so that you can see the image from both sides. I I like, how do I describe? I like working with my hands first in terms of creating an artistic image. And then I like diffusing this kind of analog image through different digital tools. Mm -hmm. So I took a combination of photos and writings. I made a huge wall collage uh, where I took more photos of the wall collage and then I diffused the wall collage through digital tools where in a sense you cannot, you would not know that, uh, that the base of what you're seeing actually does come from, from the archive in a sense. But in doing that, that creates other shapes and shadows um, that allows... I was thinking a lot about memory and how memory, you know, of, of the many memories that we have of things that we've all been through, how they begin to shape and change depending. Um, and so what I tried to create was an immersive environment where the witness will be able to get some sensation of the, of the, move, the fleeting movement of, of memory, um, but the many ways in which it's so fleeting, you're not necessarily sure what you're hearing or what you're looking at, but you're getting the essence of something. I was only able to imagine what it was going to be like. I stood in the stairwell and I was just saw it was still a work that, you know, was in, in under construction, but I got a sense, they told me it was going to be all these channels of sound and I thought well, it was going to, be really great and the nice part about it is i'm going to be in berlin when it opens and so oh, i'm going to get to see it and i have one more question for you um sure. i remember hearing i don't know if you did you ever hear this or people hear this someone said I forget, every person is an archive I, you know this reminds me i heard a talk once at harvard by brent hayes edwards he was there um uh, uh, Skip Gates brought him in, you know, and he talked about, he gave a talk about a longtime Columbia University employee, a staff person, not a faculty person, who had amassed an archive of his experiences that ended up constituting a real trove about black gay life in the 40s and 50s. Now, you refer to the Robesons as living, breathing representatives of an oppressed history, while at the same time fighting for a liberated reimagining that will have much more hope, understanding, and respect for the tenets of basic human dignity. Now, when I read that, I'd say, well, somebody could have written that about you. I mean, do you understand your work in that way? I mean, you were saying that somehow you didn't experience what they experienced. It wasn't quite as bad. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you were in a different world here. Yeah, I mean, this, the last few years alone, um, you know, and just looking today at uh, another um, victim of, of police brutality in, in the U.S. I, was, I started my morning that way. Um, I see, I, you know, the way in which I run around the world jumping borders, it's, I see a direct correlation to the fact that the freedoms that I have in doing that were laid track by people like the Robesons. Like I really see that connectivity um, of, of certain freedoms that I, at this point, take for granted in a sense, or certain things, you know, um, the, the racism I, I experience is so, is, is muted in a sense, but is still quite clear. Um, but my reaction to some of those situations is very, very different, I feel, than uh, what it might have signaled um, to the Robesons at a certain 
time. Um, I am perpetually in shock, however, at the ways in which it's become clearly obvious uh, that most, much of the, the progress that has been made, some of it was lip service. That, that's how I'm I, taking it in now, like, oh, okay. That was, you know, it looks good on the outside, but behind, you know, closed doors or underneath the paper or underneath the bed is a whole mess of, of um, a whole mess of things. And, and I just hope that for, for generations past me will not have the same sort of theme and variation experience, that it will be something else freer and new and more open than anything anything that we could see in the same way that the Robesons, I feel like they saw, like they foresaw some of the freedoms that I have had as an arts person. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. I look forward to seeing this piece and you should all get down here to the Academy der Künste and check it out. Um, Kira Thurman, you just published this amazing book, Singing Like Germans, <laughs> Black Musicians in the Land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. And you recount the experiences of afro diasporic performers in Germany, stretching back more than a century. You know, in other words, we didn't just get here yesterday. And I mean, this is really an unprecedented book. You know, it situates the struggles and triumphs of African-American leader singers in Germany and the world. You situate that in the context of this really deep and abiding engagement with German classical music. I mean, look, in Chicago, they had Handel's Messiah every year in the black community, and not just in one place. It's probably the same where you grew up. Everybody was doing it. So, and it wasn't just that. I mean, but you're talking about late 19th century and mid 20th century African American creative artists, intellectuals like Paul and Eslanda Robeson, but also just everyday plain folks. And you also bring out these kind of hidden histories, as uh, George Lipsitz would say, these hidden, hidden histories often fraught of the German speaking world's relationship with blackness. And really what comes out for me is a kind of creolized mosaic diaspora and identity for classical music. music. Now, in the essay you sent, you wrote of Paul Robeson's 1960 performances in the German Democratic Republic. You write, Robeson's tour created an opportunity for East Germans to redress or affirm their own beliefs about blacks and musical aesthetics. East Germans also reinforced their own constructs of race and African-American identity, praising him for evoking a particular kind of black authenticity that they admired. And that reminded me that often enough, the archive, especially perhaps this one, comes bundled with a kind of anxiety. I'm thinking here about James Sneed's well-known essay on repetition in black culture. And he saw the use of repetition in ways that encouraged a self-bounded cultural entity, you know, like, I don't know, the GDR back at that time, or a certain notion of what it meant to be German, a self-bounded cultural entity, encouraging repeating to maintain a sense of continuity about itself. And what I wanted to ask you was, does the reception of Robeson, Paul Robeson in the GDR, reflect not only German constructions of race and African-American identity, but also constructions, German, Germany's own constructions of its own identity? That's a really great question. Um, and I think the answer, at least in an East German context is yes. Uh, that one of the things, again, one of the reasons why I think Paul Robeson is held up uh, is in part because he is so comfortably un-German as well, but in a way that makes it so that they can celebrate him without necessarily having to wrestle with East German anti-Black racism, right? Um, and so that I think is maybe the thing that's missing uh, and the context that I'm trying to bring with my book, which is which is actually not out quite yet, is coming out in September, but it's it's almost there, almost there. Um, but you know, is is taking seriously or thinking seriously about what does German 
anti-Black racism look like? And how do we put it in conversation with this really long history of African-American musicians going going to Germany and Austria? Um, and that the reason for this uh, impetus, like the reason in a lot of ways for this project is to is to take more seriously, I think, or to think more seriously and more critically about Black German expressions and Black German, um, you know, activism and and sort of uh, claims to German identity that are always ignored. Um, in fact, one of the things I was thinking of, which is so interesting, and it had never occurred to me until we started talking in this panel, is that I think the Paul Robeson archive is the only, I wonder if it's the only archive in Germany that's dedicated to a Black person, mm. like the, the collection, right? If it's the only archive, and, and, and in terms of quote-unquote official state-sponsored receiving federal funding kind of archive that is supporting uh, a person of African descent or that is dedicated to a person of African descent. I say that also because um, down the road in vetting in Berlin is EOTO or Each One Teach One, right? Which is a black German center. It's fantastic. Everybody please visit Each One Teach One, EOTO. And they also have their own archive dedicated to uh, black German materials. Um, and the like, and, uh, you know, and so it's so, and it's, it's sort of a makeshift archive that's been forming in the last 10 to 20 years, starting with one collection and then moving on. And I know there are some materials at the Freie Universität uh, in Berlin on my AIM in particular, um, but it's not, it's never really been processed. It's not really official. So it's really interesting to ask ourselves the question, maybe what does it mean that this archive, the Paul and Aslana Robeson archive, is perhaps the only, you know, official archive um, in, in Germany, in German-speaking Europe, uh, dedicated to a person of African descent. And, and, and that is an African American, it's not a black German, right? I mean, I think these are questions worth asking. Um, and it maybe ties to, I think, Doreen's point about, you know, thinking about archives, thinking about decolonization efforts, thinking about um, whose voices we hear, whose voices we don't hear um, in, in the archive, if I, if I can say it that way. Um, you know, I could keep talking. I don't want to take up too much time. But, you know, when I started my project years ago, um, uh, looking for different Black musicians and different Black people in German archives, you know, I think a lot of people were like, will you find anybody? Right? And that speaks to this assumption of, of sort of tying Germanness to whiteness all the time, right? And it's also this assumption of, you know, and, and maybe this gets to Mat Matana's point as well about um, this idea that what Black people have never traveled anywhere <laughs> outside of America, you know, and so, and so, whereas that's not, none of these things are true, right? Uh, Germany is a multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic state and country. Um, African Americans have always traveled around the world to seek freedom, right? And so putting these things together in conversation, it just really needs to happen. It just really needs to, you constantly have to push back against these different kinds of myths, I think. Well, you're making me think about the, the non-official archives, which are thus placing pressure on the mainstream regimes, such as I'm thinking of Savvy Contemporary Gallery here in Berlin and their work uh -huh. on Anton Wilhelm Amo, the 18th century black German philosopher, mm -hmm. their Anton Wilhelm Amo Center. When you go there, you see this is an archive in progress, which is not just a, not just a collection of materials, but a collection of minds. And so yeah. this is very important. Now, what I got in your paper, and this takes me back to repetition, this ongoing, repeated effort to deploy the Robeson story kind of as an epistemological other, you know, to main sense of, maintain a sense of continuity about the GDR. You know, you quote all these uh, press, press things, I mean, these press uh, receptions. Mm -hmm. He was a black giant, a black prophet, a black Jesus, a black St. Francis, their black brother. <laughs> A headline reading, yeah. Robeson, your big black friend, performing nega musique, nega lyrique at the Volksbühne. Mm -hmm. Now, oh yeah, did I mention he was black? 
mean, what are you what are you going to do with that? Now, was this you know was this kind of dynamic limited to the GDR and its interpretation of socialism, or do we find similar resonances today? Oh, um, well, yes, there are similar resonances. Yes, that this is in some ways, you know, uh, and perhaps this is what all of us are also talking about uh, with our different projects are, you know, the, the ways in which we see different moments when maybe societies, individuals are trying to confine Black people, right, are trying to limit them. And that one way in which that happens is through, you know, musical reception, I guess I would say, and, and the sort of expectations that we place on Black bodies. I think this is what Matima was talking about as well. Um, you know, the, like the expectations we place on Black bodies and Black people. Um, you know, and so it's it's always ongoing that we have constant expectations, sonic expectations. I think Doreen mentioned this a little bit earlier as well. Sonic expectations of Black people, visual and sonic, um, what they should look like, what they should sound like, um, that need to somehow confirm or conform, you know, to or confirm, you know, conform with people's ideals, um, you know. And so we see that in in the reception of Paul Robeson as well, that, um, you know, so so much of how they describe his voice, and this maybe gets us to the the conversation about race and sound, uh, George, that you alluded to earlier. You know, so many conversations about his about his voice uh, just tie into these long-standing kind of stereotypes in a lot of ways of of black voices as dark, as smoky. Um, you know, using this kind of language to to describe you know, black singers' voices. And it's not to say that Paul Robeson's voice, I mean, he was a, a, a baritone, right? I mean, he did have a low voice. Um, but the thing that alarms me is just how often I see it across, you know, ac across the board for any black musician. You can be a high soprano and somebody is still going to say, ooh, dark, smoky. And, and you're like, no, that's not, that's not true. You know, so... Um, but these are the ways in which then we see these expectations like placed on black bodies and what they're supposed to sound like. I mean, that's, I should also say that's just in performance um, and that's in musical performance specifically. But again, just drawing attention to black German experiences that black Germans all the time e experience uh, before they even open their mouths, white Germans will speak to them in English. Right. And things like that. These kinds of expectations about black Germans is also it's all part of the same thing. It's all part of the same way in which there is an expectation of blackness, an expectation of what it should sound like, where it is located, um, you know, and and then and that for me, like the Paul Robeson's experience in a lot of ways, like can, can like it, it all fits so perfectly with like what in a lot of ways, the East German state, you know, was expecting and what they had wanted uh, from from a certain kind of black activist and a certain kind of black person. You know, and I I'm was really critical. At, I know. Sorry. No, no, not at all. Because I was looking at okay. I was I was reading uh, uh, Natasha A. Kelly's book Afroism, yeah. and oh, uh, she says right here. Yeah. Häufig werden dunkelhäutige Menschen auf Englisch angesprochen, weil sie für Asylanten oder Ausländer gehalten werden, selten aber für Deutsche, die in Deutschland aufgewachsen sind und die deutsche Sprache sprechen. So, you know, it's just what you said. So, I mean, like, right there, and she's experienced this, you've experienced it, I've experienced it. Now, I'm not even German, I still experience it. But I mean, like, you know, we're all experiencing it. So, the thing is that there is an expectation that, as you say, that's placed on black sound. I mean, you said at one point, mm -hmm. the critic then offered a general description of what black music sounded like. Or yeah. uh, 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 the one of the critics from the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung of our Afro-Diasporic mm -hmm. concert in March said, Merz Musik sucht den black sound. 
And so uh, if, if Maître Zig didn't know what it is, the critic was going to tell us what it was going to sound like. <laughs> In other words, he felt he could tell us what black, or, or what it should sound like, which was right. astonishing. <laughs> so these kinds of things are still going on today. And I do yeah. have only one more question for you because um, we could talk for a few minutes before we have to wrap up. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to do these serial interviews, but in a way you can just cut them out and use them for some personal purpose, you know, like I don't know what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was very happy that people were thinking so deeply about this, I was, you know, and that we were able to really converse about this. Um, you know, I don't know. I had two questions, but I'm going to try to sneak this one in first. Um, you talked about R Robeson's, you know, their first visit to the Soviet Union. Now, he said, here I am not a Negro, but a human being for the first time in my life. I walk in full human dignity. And, you know, I've read, I've read this quote a lot. It's often represented as Robeson's affirmation of socialism, but everybody who came to Europe said the same thing, right? Oh, suddenly yeah. I'm not a Negro anymore. Josephine Baker, je deux, je deux amour, you know, mon <laughs> pays, okay. I yeah. mean, or, or all those writers, those jazz musicians, but not the computer music people, I can tell you that. But... <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, I mean, was Robeson's experience in East Germany a case where race becomes more det determinate, even over-determinate, than ideology? Hmm. Oh, interesting. And by, when you say race becomes over-determinate over ideology, do you mean for Robeson or do you mean for the people that he encountered, I guess? I mean for the people he encountered. That's right. For the GDR, okay. for mm. you know, the people okay. in the GDR. Or even, for that matter, not just the GDR, because it seems to me there is a white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy ideolo okay. ideology going on right now in, you know, in the West, mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. And so right. the question is whether race over-determines that ideology, ideology as well. Oh, interesting. I mean, I'm trying not to be quite so simplistic as to say yes. Um, yeah, right. It's more complicated. Even than that. <laughs> right? Um, you know, but that, but that again, the thing that I find so interesting about about Robeson's experience is that how neatly he was able to fit into a racial ideology, a communist ideology. I, you know, the ways in which he was able to fulfill so many wishes and desires. Um, and I, I should say this uh, because in contrast, um, and I wish I'd thought to put uh, or to share an image um, in advance, uh, he has a friend and colleague in Berlin at the same time who's, who is African-American named Aubrey Pankey, who mm -hmm. um, also has uh, documents at the Academie der Künste Archive. Um, and Aubrey Pankey is having a very different experience than uh, Paul Robeson. Aubrey Pankey, um, uh, he uh, pled asylum in East Germany in 1955, I want to say, and he lives there until his death in 1971. Mm -hmm. um, so he has his whole career in East Berlin and in East Germany and Rostock and other places. Halle, I think he also went to, um, you know, and, and he, as much as he, and he was a committed Marxist and socialist, um, but at the same time, he was constantly pointing out to people the ways in which they were trying to put him in this box of authenticity and how he hated it. He hated these expectations put on him. You know, he was a classically trained singer. He had studied at the Boston University, I think maybe also at Juilliard. Um, but time and time again, you know, nobody wanted to hear him sing German Lieder. Nobody wanted to hear him, you know, for different kinds of classical performances. They wanted him to play these roles of, you know, African American preacher in in a piece of music, you know, that was just spoken text. And um, you know, and and so we we so that's what I mean as well about about. You know, and, for, and this is not an indictment of Paul Robeson or Eslanda or Eslanda either, but it's more that. Uh, you know, how neatly they fit into this East German expectation, right? How perfectly they performed this East German expectation in a way that Aubrey Pinky did not and could not um, as somebody who lived there for 20 years and was, you know, constantly interacting with white East Germans and constantly insisting 
on his right to, you know, sing German music and do other things um, that, that didn't fit with this expectation. Hmm. Wow. We, we have a few more minutes, and I had one question that, based on that, that maybe we could all think about, and we could all respond in our own way, or, or talk about something else if you want to. I've been, you know, I've been talking. It's always sort of some sort of, uh, you know, anyway, we could listen to this. Let me see what you think. Let me see what you think about this. You know, to me, this related to another invocation of repetition, this time Homi Baba's notion of a stereotype. And what he calls it, he calls it, quote, the repeatability in changing historical and discursive conjunctures. And this is also, I think, a form of inter interpolation along the, times that, along the lines that Doreen mentioned her say about the interpolation, interpolation of inquiry. So Baba sees stereotypes as inimical, as most of us do. But, you know, this is really often precisely what is desired by a given community. I mean, you, you could see this constant repetition that R.B. Pankey was fighting against as an expression of desire for him to behave in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a couple of years ago, I was in, um, in Frankfurt where the wonderful conductor from Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwean American conductor, Vimbai Kaziboni was often present. So I went into the concert hall and a very nice older woman came to me and said, sind Sie Herr Kaziboni? <laughs> <laughs> and to me, I told Vimbali, I said, this is expresses a desire for you. <laughs> you know, yeah. imagine yeah. they could mistake me for you. It's absurd, right? <laughs> but, um, but the idea is there, there's a certain type of desire. And in that case, this unchanging eternal essence, you can't really step out of it. You know, the archive in that case maybe represents the reified remains of repetition. Yeah. And so... I'm wondering if there's anything there that, or if that is not interesting, you could talk about something else. But at this point, open season on whatever people want to talk about that you didn't, that we didn't I get mean, to in the next nine minutes or so. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really like that assessment. I will also say, and I wonder how, how Doreen would understand this as well as, as well as Matana, but, um, you know, I am wondering if, uh, how do I want to put it, that even if the archive was built for one purpose, right, to maybe fulfill this desire, I think, you know, particularly Matina's uncoverings and Doreen's of these, you know, different sound recordings and, and other kinds of images and things like that, they kind of can sometimes betray the archive itself, which is maybe interesting and gives me hope, I guess mm -hmm. I could say something like that, you know, that, um, uh, yeah, the materials in, inside the archive, even if collected for one purpose, might be able to be reconstituted, right, and reused, re like, for a different purpose, maybe, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything now. I've been talking a lot. Somebody else got to say something. <laughs> I see Martina was talking, but I don't know yeah, if the Martina, microphone were you talking? Was we couldn't hear you. We can't hear Martina again. No? Yeah, you're on, no? Yeah. No, I was just saying what's so fascinating about that archive or, or about archives in general are the multiple points of entry um, that are available to uh, the someone who wishes to peruse through. But what I particularly like about Black archives or archives where the where Blackness is centered is there's so much code that I feel is, um, is not available to everyone. There were certain things that I took from looking in that archive that I, I think I would only recognize as certain ways of being. Um, and there are other things that I'm, I'm sure it would be that way for others as well. So I think that's a really fascinating thing to think about. Is Mata frozen yeah. now? Can we talk to someone else? Doreen, are you there? Yes, I 
Yeah, I think uh, Montana is, the image is frozen. I'm not sure whether Montana finished. Uh, yeah, but in the meantime, okay. what do you think yeah. about any of this? I mean, as we as we move toward the end, are there any last things you'd like to say or stuff well, we didn't get to? I mean, absolutely, I, I agree this uh, very much. I mean, Angela Davis is a continuation of this uh, iconographization, I think, of uh, the way how Paul Robeson has been uh, put on, you know, on the stage. And um, so uh, this has so many kind of levels and layers has to do with the way how it is promoted and narrated at that time, but also how important it is to look into these minor details of archival substances and also that what uh, I'm, and thank you Kira really for pointing out, you know, how important it is to know about the friendships that uh, Robeson had with Afro-Germans in Germany of the 50s, 60s. And this is all history that is unfinished. I mean, this has to be made accessible, like public, but, you know, how is it going to resonate and be, um, redistributed, rearticulated and metabolized in the present moment that it does not happen at the same time again. So also like in terms of how can we make sure that the generations to come do not have to do the whole work once more, so to speak. So, and this is uh, an ongoing uh, struggle. I mean, uh, there's so many things are missing. I mean, so many, so many archives have been thrown away also in 1989, 1990. And this is, of course, uh, you know, what do you do with that? So we have to work with these absences as well. Uh, so it's a lot of work to do and a lot of rethinking. And I think I'm looking forward to see your installation, Sonic Articulation at uh, Matena at the Academy. Uh, and to follow up your book, Kira. Very, very compelling. Thank you. Yes, very much. If I can recommend uh, two different things that that speak in this direction, that Doreen you might also find interesting. Uh, what I don't, I don't think I have it here with me, unfortunately. But um, uh, Tiffany Florville's new book um, called "Mobilizing Black Germany." on the Afro-German movement. Um, it came out last year. And what's so fascinating about it is exactly this question of archives. And basically, and she's really open about this, that, that she had to circumvent the usual archives in order to tell this Afro-German history. And so what she did was she visited different women's homes and would just be in their kitchen tables having tea with them or coffee and asking them what they had in their house. You know, and from it, she was able to build her own archive of Afro-German activism in the 1980s um, and 1990s. It's a really, really cool um, project, I think, for thinking about archives and whose voices or who do we see in the archive? Who do we not see in the archive? You know, and, and Tiffany's solution for getting around that. Um, and then I think the last thing in terms of me plugging something or advertising something, in addition, it's the website blackcentraleurope.com, which is what I run with uh, colleagues like Tiffany uh, and others. Um, and it's just a repository of historical documents in the original German and also translated into English and vice versa. Um, and it's exactly, I think, Doreen, this, this attempt to try to create some sort mm -hmm. of archive um, that is digital and available to everybody of Black experiences in Germany. So that's, I mean, we'll see how long it lasts or whatever, right? But it's this idea of like, how do we, how do we keep this going is the, is the question. Yeah. Well, there is going to be a conference. Maybe I can just add, George, if you allow. Sure. There is a conference that is uh, co-convened by Tiffany and Katharina Varda, who is mm. a brilliant also Afro-German writer on uh, what she calls Dunkel Germany, and Katrin Barr on uh, minorized uh, voices and decolonizing the East German experience in, I think, fall. And uh, so things are happening. So this is also, it hasn't happened five years ago. Things are breaking open now more and more because there is a need for that. And um, I'm looking forward to follow up uh, the recommendations also and the references. Thank you. Well, I very much enjoyed this um, conversation with the three of you. And um, I hope uh, audiences, I hope you got something out of this as well. And I'd like to just 
thank uh, Martha Roberts, Kira Thurman, or Doreen Mende for their rich thoughts, ideas, interpretations. And I think we have to stop now because that's one of the interesting things about being in Germany is that you have to do things on time, you know? Or as Heiner Müller once put it, fünf Minuten vor der Zeit ist die wahre Pünktlichkeit. But we're not really five minutes before, so I'm, we're going to stop here. And thank you, both. thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you so much, George. Really, it was a so great much. pleasure. Thank you, thank you. and everyone thank organizing that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Merci.